happening, everyone? It's good to see you in the Lord's house today. Thank you so much for coming out and being a part of our services. Thank you, visitors, for being here with us as well. We just want to make you feel welcome. We hope that you have been made to feel welcome, but we do, in fact, welcome you here and glad that you're here on this very last Sunday of January. Let's stand and sing a couple of songs together. Everyone stand with me, please. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangel, sing. will guard his children in his arms he carries him all day long praise him praise him tell of his excellent greatness praise him praise him ever in joyful song praise him praise him jesus our blessed redeemer for our sins he suffered and bled and died eternal salvation Jesus are crucified sound his praises Jesus who bore our sorrow love unbound it wonderful deep and strong praise him praise him tell of his excellent greatness praise him praise him ever in joyful song praise him praise him Jesus, our blessed redeem. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power, glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent grace. be seated and that ought to be our theme for our service this morning is praising him praising him for all of his greatness and goodness to each and every one of us i have a song i love to sing since i have been redeemed of my redeemer savior king since i have been redeemed since i Praising Him, glorifying Him is just something that we've learned from the Bible, from Isaiah, from Revelation when it talks about these very words. Holy, holy, holy is our Lord. Holy, holy, holy.
our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around glassy sea, cherubim, seraphim, falling down before thee, which were of words, holy, 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 a little different sound, a little different tune, but another one of those songs that talk about praising Him and singing songs for Him and worshiping Him, praising Him, glorifying Him.
Father, we love you. We are so grateful for the time together that we can worship you, we can honor you, praise you, and glorify you. Lord, I just ask that you would uh, be with Steve as he brings this message to us this morning, that you would hide him behind the cross, give him the thoughts and the words that you have been dealing with him with uh, for all week long. We just love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you all today. And You know, after a song like that, that's called the Revelation song. I think we ought to just start Revelation and go through it. What do you think? (laughs) Now, for those of you who are relatively new, um, that's kind of an inside joke because over really ending about a year ago now, I preached through the book of Revelation. It took three years to do it. And so there's a lot there. And so I tell you, um, it is worthy of study, but there's so much to study, isn't there? There's so many different things to look at in the Bible and to study, and it's a process that we go through our whole lives of learning and studying and contemplating the Word of God. Now, last week, we looked at the heavens. We looked at the stars, and we considered the stars, and we even considered the possibility that the constellations in the stars told the story of God. We began in Psalm 19, verse 1. It said, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Is it possible that the constellations, instead of being some type of something used for horoscopes, and I didn't look up my horoscope today to share that with you like I did last week, but is it possible that the constellations originally were intended for the glory of God? The heavens are telling of the glory of God and told the story. Is it possible that the constellations were like a picture book that before there was writing, that people could look at basically the picture book in the stars and pass down the oral tradition of basically the New Testament. Now, as the earth orbits around the sun, it kind of makes a path and reveals the stars uh, throughout the year. And this path is often referred to as the ecliptic path. Then the moon rotates around the earth about every, well, every 28 days. And that breaks it up into basically 12 different signs, 12 different zodiac signs. Now, I want to read to you, and I read this last week. Charles Dupuy was a scholar who lived in the 1700s, and he did an investigation trying to support his idea that the life of Christ was a myth. And so every nation that he looked into, one of the basic fundamental beliefs that was prevalent in most nations was of a divine person born of a woman, suffering in conflict with a serpent, but triumphing in the end. Then he said something that's very interesting related to what we're talking about. He said he finds the same ideas reflected in the figures of the ancient constellations. So now if I'm right about that, I do believe that the ancient primitive constellations were used as a guide to pass along the oral tradition, then they would have to be extremely old. Well, how old do we know that they are? Well, first of all, we know that they are older than the Bible. And I'm not going to turn to Job 26, 13. But in Job, there are many mentions to constellations. And Job is believed to be the oldest written book. It doesn't have the oldest information, such as in Genesis, but it is believed to be the oldest written book in the Bible. And the constellations obviously predate Job because Job spoke of them. Well, 
Archaeologists have now confirmed that the constellations or the, uh, the ancient constellations are older than the pyramids. So that's getting on back there pretty good. Now, if you go to the Oriental nations, which I believe did a much better job of keeping, keeping records than most of our nations, the Oriental nations date the constellations back to more than 3400 B.C. So that would put them back in around the time that the alphabet was first laid out and first discovered as far as records go. So that kind of fits. Now, along the ecliptic path, the story begins with the constellation of Virgo and proceeds all the way to Leo. Now, the constellation of Virgo, Virgo means virgin. Do you think that's a coincidence? So now I want to turn to uh, Genesis chapter 3.15. If you've never seen this verse, it is the first time that God lays out in the written word the promise. And it happens immediately after the fall. Now, don't you think that's interesting? Man sinned and man fell and man was kicked out of the garden, but God has immediately told them of a promise that's coming, a way to fix the problem. And let's see what that is. Genesis 3.15, he's already basically laid out the curse on the serpent. And then now in 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman. That enmity within would be between Satan and Israel. And now we are not Israel, but we are the family of God. And so that enmity lies between us and Satan and also still lies between Satan and Israel. We are under attack. You know, do you think it's a... Do you, where do you think this COVID thing came from? And churches across the United States are struggling. I told you last year, the very first January, we had 160-something. This year, our very first January, we had 60-something. That's 100 difference. You know, we've, many people would have come and visited. I'm not talking about our members that are shelter in place. I'm talking about many people would have come and visited. Some people would have come and heard the gospel that have not heard it. But now I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now, what do you think her seed is? Look at this. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Do you see the promise? The promise would come through the woman's seed. The woman is often referred to in the Bible as Israel, but I think there's more to it than that. It has to do with the virgin birth. You know, the virgin birth, I'm fascinated sometimes to find even Christians that do not believe in the virgin birth. They find it too hard to believe. They can believe that Lazarus came out of the grave. They can believe that God created everything out of nothing. They can believe that they have eternal life, but they can't believe in the virgin birth. They can't believe, they, they believe that God just breathed these massive stars into existence, but the virgin birth is too much. I find that fascinating. You know, Jesus said when they, when they asked him, when he said he told the person that was paralyzed, your sins are forgiven. And then the scribes and Pharisees who were, who were around in the room also said, well, only God can forgive sins. And, and Jesus said, well, so you know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on the earth? Rise up and walk, which is easier to believe. Now, turning to Isaiah chapter 7, we're going to hit some Christmas scriptures here, ones that are normally hit over Christmas, because guess what? The story in the stars, in the constellations, begins with the virgin birth. And what we're going to see, if we were to study through all of these things, that the constellations basically tell the New Testament. It starts with Virgo. It starts with the virgin birth and works its way all the way to Leo, the lion. Now, starting in Isaiah 7, verse 10. And I'm going back a little bit because I want to grab some of these scriptures. I think there's some neat things in these. The Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Now, I tell you in this verse, I love this verse because what God is going to say, he's going to tell them there's going to be a virgin birth. And this goes back to Genesis 3.15 to the promise. And he's telling them, he's going to tell them this. This is going to be a sign. But look, 
Look at, listen to what God is saying. He's saying, hey, ask of something. Ask me for anything. Ask me for anything. And what he's doing, he's, he's basically telling Ahaz, you'll never guess it. It's like a present. You'll never guess it. You can never guess big enough. If before it happened, if we were to, even before the creation of the world, if God could bring you in, God would have brought you into existence. And under your wildest dream, God would have said, I'm going to give you a present. Guess it. Guess it. Guess what it is. I, God Almighty, am going to come as a person. And I'm going to pay the price for your sin by dying a torturous death on a cross. And then I'm going to be raised again. And after I'm raised again, you by faith will be co-inheritors with me. Who would even ask such a thing of Almighty God? You can hear it in his voice when he said, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. God's going to bring it about. Even if you didn't ask it, he's going to bring this about. He's going to bring about the redemption of man as he promised all the way in Genesis 3 after the fall. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This was so hard for people to understand and to believe. We have the benefit of hindsight, but yet people even here sometimes don't believe it with the benefit of hindsight. So now Virgo. Virgo is basically the Virgin Mary. Now imagine that. If you're Mary and you're a chosen vessel of God to carry this Messiah, this baby, the Christ, God in the flesh, and you're the chosen vessel, I wonder if she knew that she was in the constellations. Can you imagine that? Now, carrying that baby, that was, it was a blessing. But it also brought about great difficulty and sacrifice. Now, I tell you, in the, in the Baptist churches, you know, when the Pentecostal movement came through and the charismatic movement, then it almost became ungood to mention ungood. Did I just say that from up here? I did. Well, let's just go with it. It became ungood. It became ungood to talk about the Holy Spirit or to raise your hands in church. Oh, we don't do that here. We kind of overreact in the other direction. Well, we also kind of overreact when it comes to Mary also. We don't deify Mary, and Mary shouldn't be deified, but she does deserve honor for her sacrifice and her faithfulness. I can't imagine looking up into the stars and, and Mary being able to see a constellation that was Virgo, and she understands now that she is the Virgo. The virgin birth was miraculous, and it came about through the seed of the woman. It came about through Israel and also the seed of the woman. Joseph was the adopted father of Jesus Christ. He was the adopted father. He was not the birth father. Now, Adam and Eve in the garden, they didn't have th this inherited sin nature. They earned the sin nature when they rebelled against God. And then that sin nature, according to the Bible, is passed down to you and me through what they earned when they fell out of the garden. Okay, and the Bible leads, there's a lot of debate among theologians of how this exactly happens. I don't think it comes about through the Y chromosome, Okay. I don't think it's a physical transfer. I think it's a spiritual transfer, but it passes from the father down to the, through the generations. So now the idea is that God had known this and planned it from the beginning that he would bring about the Messiah through the seed of the woman and the Holy Spirit. So what this means is that Jesus Christ, like Adam and Eve, was fully capable of sin. But he wasn't born with it like you and me. He was like Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall. Now, Adam and Eve fell, and Jesus was tempted in every which way, but he never had sin. He lived a life without sin. He wasn't born with sin, and he lived a life without sin. He lived the perfect life. So the virgin birth was miraculous. Now, looking at the constellation Virgo, in her right hand 
is a head of wheat. And sometimes you can gather truth from these constellations because things that have happened over time is that they've been changed or perverted in another direction. Okay, and so sometimes the name of the stars that are in the constellation can give you insight into what the original, the original meaning of the constellation was. So in, in her right hand lies a head of wheat, and the star, which is the, whole, the brightest star in the whole constellation of Virgo, is named Spica, which is also means head of wheat. So in her hand is a head of wheat. Now I'm going to turn to Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, it kind of takes along with Genesis chapter 3 and continues with this idea of the seed, as it's mentioned in Genesis 3.15. Remember the seed of the woman? Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds. And so the seed, going back to Genesis chapter 3, is one seed then, and not all the seeds of Abraham, therefore the nation of Israel. Do you see that? That's the argument that Paul is making. So now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is Christ. So the seed that's being spoken of is referring to Jesus Christ who would come about from the seed of the woman, Israel, and also the woman, the Virgin Mary. So now, amazing that in her right hand happens to be a head of wheat or seed, and the brightest star in Virgo of a whole constellation is Spica, which is, means head of wheat or seed. So the brightest star in all the constellation of Virgo is the head of wheat, the seed. And who is that seed? It's Jesus Christ. You need some help this morning. I'll help you. Okay, in her left hand is a branch or a shoot. Now I want to turn back to Jer Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. Some of these things have happened, and some of them have not happened yet. They'll happen in the millennial kingdom. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is his name by which he will be called. This righteous branch out of David will be called the Lord our righteousness. Isn't that interesting? So in the right hand is the seed, and the left hand is the righteous branch of Virgo. Now, I think it's also of note that Virgo is not upright. She's not standing up. She's laying down. And I think this signifies that Virgo is part of fallen man. We are all fallen, but she's laying down, and in her hand is the wheat, the seed, and the righteous branch. How can she get back up? How can man get back up? There's only one way, by the seed who comes through the righteous branch. You know, Mary was a vessel and she needed a savior like you and me, although she is worthy of great honor for the sacrifice that she made to bring about the promises of God. Well, every constellation, Virgo is a primary constellation, one of the signs of the zodiac, and there are 12, and so I'm pretty certain that I'm not going to go through all 12 because we're going through Virgo today. That would take us pretty much all the way to Easter. Um, I do think these things are interesting, and it goes back into the antiquities. But honestly, we have something far greater now. We have the Word of God. We don't have to pass it on by oral tradition anymore without the Word of God. We have the Word of God that we can pass on orally. So these things do bring honor and glory to God, but at the same time, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on them. And some of you may be asking, well, what about the feasts? He's been us, promising us about the feast for a long time, and I haven't done the Levitical feasts. Well, here's my plan for the feast, just so you know. My plan for the feasts are this year to do them on the approximate date at which they would have originally been observed. Huh. I kind of like that. I'm glad you do too. <laughs> now, the first one then, 
The first study on the feast is going to be on our new, our brand new Good Friday service. So that'll be the first one I do on the feasts, which we're planning on. We're having two new services this year. One will be on Good Friday at 7 p.m., and then we'll have Easter Sunday service, as we always do. And then the other new service that we're going to do is a candlelight service on December 25th, Christmas Day, in the evening at 7 p.m. The reason we did it then, that's non-traditional, which I think of us as pretty traditional, but we're non-traditional sometimes. Okay, and 20, the candlelight service is normally Christmas Eve, but Christmas Eve, I don't know about you and your family, it's always a very busy time. But Christmas Day in the evening is normally not. And I'll tell you this, my mother passed away at the end of 2019, and she loved Christmas. I mean, she just loved it. But always, everybody would drive away and be gone by the, by the 25th or in the morning of the 25th to get somewhere else. And she always looked so sad and was really depressed on Christmas Day. And I don't think she was alone in that. A lot of times in the evening of Christmas Day, it's kind of quiet. Everybody's gone back home, not as busy. And so we're planning to do a candlelight service at 7 p.m. on Christmas Day this year. If nobody shows up but me, then we'll change it. So you know how to vote on that, I guess, if you want it another day. Okay, where was I? You guys aren't paying attention either. Oh, yes, one of the 12 signs, Virgo, we're still there. Now, each sign, Virgo, has different deacons, which I think is an interesting name for that, don't you? And these deacons are in support of the first sign. And so in all, every sign of the zodiac, there are 12, has supporting constellations that go with it. And so there are 48 in total, but there are 12 deacons overall. Now, I do think this is interesting in itself. Imagine before the Word of God, before you're meeting as a church, okay, and you've, you understood, it was passed down to you from your, your ancestors, it was passed down to you, what these, all these constellations meant. So you basically have like a picture book that would help you pass down and remember the oral traditions of basically the New Testament from the virgin birth to the end. And then there's 48 of them. So pretty much once a week, you have a story to tell. Does that sound very familiar to us? Where we come to church once a week? Where perhaps on the Sabbath back then they could meet and they would tell the story. They would start with the story of Virgo, okay? And they, they would take a picture and they would teach their kids, here it is, can you see it? It's this star go over here. And honestly, guys, I can't see it. And I've told you before, and I look to the skies, and then I look at the drawing of the constellations. They look like a miserable dot-to-dot drawing, honestly. But did the ancient man do this? Did God help him develop this? I think so. Now, once a week then, they could gather together. You could gather your family and lay out on a grass meadow and look up to the skies, and the dad or the mom could relay the story related to Virgo. And then the next week, he could go to the next one, which is the coma not coma as in going into a coma. Some of you are right now. But the coma is one that's been lost. It's been replaced by a Phoenician king who his wife supposedly had golden hair. And she cut it off in honor of her brother who was going to war. And somebody stole it. Well, to appease his wife, he said that it went up into the heavens and it's part of the constellations. And so now coma then has been replaced with a bundle of woman's hair by tradition. But if you go back far enough, the constellation or the deacon of Virgo that is called coma, it is a lady sitting down with an infant child in her lap. That's what it is. That's what the drawings are. Now coma in itself means the desired. Now think of that. Here you have Virgo, the wheat, the righteous branch, and then next is the birth, and she's sitting in Virgo's lap, and the name of this constellation, this deacon of Virgo, is the desired. You know, this constellation here became the Egyptian goddess of Isis, and a lot of gods came from these constellations and the perversion of them away from their original message and taken and not understood for what they were originally intended. You know, Shakespeare mentioned this one. 
he mentioned it, I don't know if it was in one of his poems or if it was in one of his plays, but he said he mentioned the good boy in Virgo's lap. So maybe I'll look that up sometime and find where he used that. Okay, the next deacon is a centaur. Yeah, do you know what a centaur is? What's that? Half beast, half man, and actually, yeah, half man and half horse. Has anybody seen the, the movies Narnia? Yeah, I like those movies. You know, those movies are really, they're taken from the Christian faith. And when C.S. Lewis wrote those, he wrote them with, and if you ever watch it again from that perspective, Aslan is basically symbolic of Christ in the movie. And there's all these different types of beasts in this land of Narnia that they live. They have minotaurs and they have centaurs. And centaurs, and they're, they're pretty awesome, by the way. But centaurs are basically a man on the front and then a horse in the back. Kind of interesting. Now, why in the world is there a centaur in this constellation in support of Virgo? It kind of seems strange at first. But aren't pictures, don't pictures do a good job of reminding us of something? I think that's exactly what's happening here. Turn to Isaiah 9, 6, another Christmas verse. We're going to just do Christmas all day today. Isaiah 9, 6. You've probably heard this. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So now what's in this is, look at this in the beginning, and there's lots of places I could have found this to point this out. But there's going to be a child born. So this child is going to be a man. But yet, at the end of 6, it says that he will be Mighty God. Do you see that? And all throughout the New Testament, this idea is presented also that he has a twofold nature. He is God and he is man. Now, that is hard to understand. It's very difficult for, to understand for the people who lived around Jesus Christ. Because remember, who are you to forgive sins? Right? Forgive sins. And he said, to show to you that I have the authority to forgive sins on the earth. Get up and walk. He's telling them, look, I'm God. He even told them another time before Abraham was, I am, which is the same words that were spoken in the burning bush, right? Before Abraham was, I am. Tell them, I am sent me. Jesus claimed to be God over and over. Now, some people will take the position that Jesus was a great moral teacher. But Jesus claimed to be God. How could a great moral teacher make a claim to be God if he wasn't? Jesus didn't leave any wiggle room. He's either a lunatic or he's God in the flesh. That's the only two alternatives if you study it sincerely. Now, obviously, I'm standing up here. I've chosen that Jesus is not a lunatic. I've chosen that Jesus is God in the flesh. Just like in Isaiah 9, 6, the prophecy about him, there would be a child born, and this child that would be born will be, at the end of verse 6, mighty God. So now, how do, what does that do with the centaur? Well, a centaur is basically two natures in one, isn't it? It's a man and a beast. Could it be that this is a reminder? This is part of the desired one, the coming one, the one that was going to be born of Virgo? Could it be that this is a lesson in the constellations about his nature, that he would be God in the flesh, and this was a reminder? Now, do you think... If you were to, if you, this was passed down to you and you had the picture of the centaur, do you think, why is the centaur there? Or do you think you would remember the twofold nature of the desired one, the one that was coming through Virgo? I think it would be easy to remember. Now, I can go to lots of scriptures about the, the twofold nature of Christ, but yet he is one. He never said we unless he was talking about the Father and Holy Spirit. He was one person, but yet he was Christ. Now, I'm going to go to some old fables. I want to tell you the, a couple fables about centaurs. I think this is interesting. 
Because, and this is evidence for what I'm saying to be true with these ancient fables. First of all, centaurs, according to ancient fables, were said to be heavenly begotten. Centaurs were also despised by gods and man. What happened to centaurs? Well, we think they're legend that they didn't really exist, that this was a symbol of the twofold nature of Christ, but then man took them to be that they were like gods and had existed in some form. But what happened eventually, according to the fables, to these centaurs? They were hunted and exterminated by man. Now, there was a chief centaur, and his name was Chiron. Now, what's interesting about this chief centaur, according to these fables, he had great wisdom and righteousness. He was immortal, but he voluntarily died of an arrow wound from the heavens, and he gave his immortality to somebody else, Prometheus. Now, isn't that peculiar? Do you think the centaur was perhaps originally intended to be about the desired one, the coma, the good boy in Virgo's lap from the Virgin Mary, the seed of the woman, that it was basically a lesson on the twofold nature of Christ that he was God and man? Most probably. Interestingly enough, one of the deacons of Libra, which is the next zodiac or the next sign of the zodiac, is... The cross, you ever heard of the cross? There's a, there's a deacon of, in, the, in the constellation of Libra that is the cross. And right under the centaur is the cross as they come into view. Now the next one is boots. This guy was a Texan? No, he wasn't. <laughs> I do think God loves Texas, though. This guy named Boots, and the Greeks, Greeks interpreted the name of Boots that was passed down to them to be a plowman or like a farmer. But in the original language, in Hebrew, in that language, Boots means the one who is to come or the coming one. Isn't that interesting? That's a lot different than farmer, right? Now, in the brightest star in this constellation is called Arcturus, and you may have heard the word Arcturus used for boots before. But Arcturus means keeper, and in the ancient language as an application, it would mean shepherd. Now, isn't that interesting? So now, as far as Virgo goes, and we're studying, you can see if this is true, and you're taking these pictures in the stars, and you're, you're applying them, how many doctrinal truths could you apply through oral tradition, and this is your guide? And then as you work through Libra, there's a set of scales. There's an animal that's died at the point spear of the twofold nature. I mean, just on and on as you work your way through. And I'm not going to go through all these. If you want to read all these and study these, I have the book. You're welcome to read through it yourself and, and further enlighten us all on the differences. But I, I'm not going to continue in this for long. So the Greeks interpret boots to be a plowman. And the brightest star in his constellation is Arcturus, which means keeper or shepherd. Now, you know, in John 10, 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. And the shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now, in the right hand of boots, often depicted, is a spear. But what if it originally was a shepherd's staff? Probably. And then an upraised arm and an upraised arm on in his left arm is a sickle. You know, Christ comes twice. He came as the sacrifice of the good shepherd, and he's coming back again at the second coming and judgment. But also, while he was here, isn't he Lord of the harvest now? Which would be depicted by the sickle. You know, I, I just want to tell you out of this that God is awesome. And the works of God are often perverted and changed. And I'll tell you, the Bible also is under attack. If I'm right that these constellations, and this author was right, these constellations originally were a pictorial guide to pass along the oral tradition, does it surprise you that they've been perverted away from the truth? It doesn't surprise me at all. 
And do you understand now that the Word of God, we have the Bible. The Word of God is being twisted and perverted away from the truth. That's why it is so important, right? You, you in this congregation, you should be checking me. Don't take my word for it. You should be checking me, and we should be checking one another. We should honor the word of God. The authority is the word of God. That's the authority. So, a summary from a summary from Virgo. I just wrote a short summary of kind of what Virgo has taught us in these symbols. Fallen man needs to be saved. Our only hope is in the seed of the woman who is the righteous branch. He is the desired one, the desire of all the nations. He is born of a virgin who has a dual nature, fully God and fully man. He is the coming one, the great shepherd and Lord of heaven who is to come again. The constellations, I believe, tell the story of Jesus Christ. It basically is the New Testament. The New Testament from Virgo to Leo. The promise of prophecy told in the Old Testament, lived out in the New Testament. The heavens declare the glory of God. Now, my God is Jesus Christ. Who is yours? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for your creative hand. God, thank you so much. And if this is true that you helped men develop these constellations to tell of the promises and prophecy laid out and that you were going to do in the future, God, and I, I absolutely thank you that, for that. God, in my heart breaks that these things have been perverted away from the truth, but there's a lesson in that. God, we, we have the word of God now. We don't need these we don't need the pictures to help with oral tradition. We have the very word of God. And God, help us to stand firm on the word and not compromise and allow Satan to pervert the truth of the gospel. God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the virgin birth. Thank you for the coming one, the desired one. Thank you for the one who is to come. Thank you that you are fully God and fully man and came in the flesh. For the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God, thank you for the salvation in Jesus' name that we all share. And God, thank you also for salvation in Jesus' name and no other name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.